the end of January 2022. And we're glad to be here in church, worshipping and celebrating God. I took my little nephew, nine years of age, to his first football game yesterday. Can you remember the first time when you came to church that you remember when you came to church. Just let have a wee moment of thinking about that as we prepare ourselves for our worship today. John's Gospel calls us to worship this morning. He did this to, so that to make what the prophet had said come true. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one I love, with whom I am pleased. I will send my spirit upon him, and he will announce my judgment to the nations. He will not argue or shout, or make loud speeches in the streets. He will be gentle to those who are weak, kind to those who are helpless. He will persist until he causes justice to triumph, and on him all people will put their hopes. Let's sing, sing now our first hymn of praise, hymn 231, For the Fruits of All Creation, a very well-known hymn tune. Sunday by Sunday, we gather to celebrate and to worship God. And we do so by different means, by the hearing of God's word, by the sharing of our thoughts. But we do so in prayer as we speak to God today. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer this morning. Lord, through this prayer, may we be surrounded by the goodness and kindness of thy holy love. May we share in that expression of joy and praise in our worship as we come to renew and re-energize our faith. Living God, in these thoughts and words, be the story and life of Jesus. Enter and live in our hearts and in our minds. May his sharpness of wit, his tenderness of heart, be the shining example of how we too can follow in the steps of grace to a life of helpfulness and direction. 
Allow us at this moment, Lord, to experience this calm and peace. In a world that moves so quickly and chaotically, that making sense of its hardships and conflicts challenge our beliefs and our faith. Help us, Lord, to, to turn away from wrongdoing. Forgive us when we close our minds to the folly of ignorance and indifference. Brighten our faces. Bring kind words to our lips. Allow our hearts to listen to the cries on our doorstep. Lord, we remember those, especially this week, those who were lost and the survivors of the Holocaust. May it serve as a reminder of the evil and horrors of a way of thinking, contrary to the life and mind of Jesus Christ. Uphold all, Lord, whose memories and history bear down upon their spirit. Comfort, inspire, and bring resilience and hope as we pray today for guidance, for teaching, and for the action of thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we gather in saying the words of the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today is a very special, special day for, for many people. Do you know what day it is today? But no. Have you not been up since the lark? We had our nine-year-old nephew. Not only did he go to his, his first football game yesterday, but he was staying overnight with us. And my wife, well, let me give you a little clue as to what special day it is. Pardon? That's right. It's the big garden day. And our house is littered with little ornaments. Now, we're not allowed to call people twitchers anymore. Apparently not. Apparently that's, that's not correct. We've got to call them birders. So anyway, for all the birders in here and all the birders out there. Um, so this was bought a, a couple of years ago. I don't know if you can see it. Focus in on it, Neil. There we go. A tiny little silver, silver bird. But um, I've got a slightly larger one here. Um, and... I bought this for my wife a few Valentines day ago. I know that's a bit cutesy, isn't it? A couple of lovebirds, I know, a couple of them. But I wanted to, to tell you a, a wee kind of personal story that happened to us, and then we'll, we'll share a, a Bible story about birds that is quite remarkable. And about a month or so back, my wife arrived back and she said, I've killed a bird. How did you kill a bird? Well, we've got lots of, of kind of pheasants wandering about the uh, countryside. So it went out to our car, and it was too small to be a pheasant. And actually, the bird was alive. I can't show you the real bird, but I can show you something that was, that was like it. I hope it's not flown away. What got stuck in my wife's radiator was a tiny owl. And it was still alive. Now, it was a very, very frosty day, and we really didn't know what to do about this. I mean, maybe it was dead, maybe it was nearly dead, I don't know. It was stuck to the grill of the car. So we, we phoned up the RSPB. And the RSPB sent out one of their roaming people to, to help animals that are injured. And Julie, this lady, said to my wife on the phone, well, take it and put it in a box. So my, my son's kind of completely fearless. So anyway, he, he went out, but he said to me, I couldn't grab this thing, Dad. Anyway, 
my wife got on a big pair of gardening gloves, and she did, and it was about this this size, and put it in a box. And Julie, the lady from the RSPB, came, and you can tell that I'm not very tech savvy because I didn't film it. I really wished I'd filmed it for you, because it, this wee thing was put in a box, and then she brought her big glove on, she brought it out the box, and held it in our lobby. And then she said, well, we'll find out whether it's still alive. So she put it down on the ground outside the house, and it flew away. Absolutely lovely. And I didn't get that on video. I'm and I just a complete and utter failure. So I had to tell you this story. So today is the great big garden day. So you can still do it online. Go out and look at your garden and see what birds are there online. And you can just fill them in and you become part of this national day where we think about birds. We think about the birds of the year. We think about the wonder of, of nature upon this day. So I'm going to share a, a Bible story that fits into our, our whole service today. And I'm just going to sit down and, and read the story and I'll just point Neil uh, at the turn of each slide. Okay. Elijah was a prophet. He was a good and holy man who listened very carefully to God. And he always tried to obey him. Then he had an important and difficult job of telling the people what God had said. Often the people didn't want to know and sometimes that made them angry. One day, God sent Elijah with a message for the king of Israel, King Ahab. He was a bad king who worshipped an idol called Baal instead of worshipping God. Many of the people did the same. This made God very sad. God said, There will be no rain in the land, not even a drop of dew, for at least two years. Elijah told the king, no one likes giving bad news to a king. King Ahab was very, very angry when he heard about this drought. Elijah knew he was in great danger. He needed a place to hide. So God told him to go far away and live in the wilds next to a stream. God promised Elijah that he'd look after him. Elijah could get water from the stream, and he promised Elijah that he would send him food. As soon as Elijah sat down by the little stream, some ravens flapped over the horizon, carrying food in their beaks. They brought him food every morning and every evening. I've often heard of people feeding the birds chuckled Elijah. But it's not often I've heard about birds feeding the people. Time passed and there was no rain. The brook dried up. The crops did not grow and there wasn't enough flour for the bread. Then God told Elijah, go to a small town and there look for a widow. As soon as Elijah reached the town, he saw a, w a widow collecting firewood. May I have a drink of water, asked Elijah, and some bread, please. The poor woman was at her wit's end. You must be joking, she cried. I have almost nothing left, only a handful of flour and a tiny drop of olive oil. I'm about to make my last meal for me and my son, then we're going to starve. Please don't worry, said Elijah. Go home and bake me a small loaf. God will look after us. God has already promised Elijah that the woman's bowl of flour and her jug of oil would not run out until the rains returned and the drought ended. After that, the woman made her loaf and the bowl of flour and the jug and oil were full again. The woman could not believe her eyes. And so each day she had enough flour and oil to make bread for herself and her son and bread for Elijah. For God himself was looking after them. 
Amen. May God bless to us this wonderful story. And despite what happens in the world, even maybe when a baby owl nearly dies, or maybe we are, things in the world are not going well for us, the belief is that God will be looking after us. sing in Jesus name we will sing for you we will lift you up in Jesus name we'll sing and pray for you you may not feel like singing we will sing for you you may feel heavy with the cares of the day we'll sing we'll sing sing in Jesus name. We will sing for you. We will lift you up in Jesus name. We'll sing and pray for you. We will surround you with our voices. We will sing for you. We will embrace you with the love of the Lord. Our self is just for you. Sing, just come as you are. We will sing for you. And you can worship in the stillness of your heart. Just come, we'll sing for you. We will sing, we will sing in Jesus' name. We will sing for you. We will lift you up in Jesus' name. We'll sing. and brothers come all around we will sing for you together we will praise that blessed joyful sound we'll sing we we'll sing for you we will sing we will sing in jesus name we will sing for you we will lift you up in jesus name we'll sing I'm going to invite Neil now to read from us from First Kings, and we'll read the scripture version of the story that you've just heard, and then we'll, we'll hear the extension. Today's sermon is, is about Elijah, the doing prophet, and how that inspires all of us to do in our life. Let's invite Neil to read that first part of the story once again. Our first reading is from First Kings uh, chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. Elijah and the widow in Zarephath. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Now go to the town of Zarephath near Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow who lives there to feed you. So Elijah went to Zarephath, and as he came to the town gate, he saw a widow gathering firewood. Please bring me a drink of water, he said to her. And as she was going to get it, he called out, and please bring me some bread too. She answered, by the living Lord your God, I, ha I swear that I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour in a bowl and a bit of olive oil in a jar. I came here to gather some firewood to take back home and prepare what little I have for my son and me. That will be our last meal and then we will starve to death. Don't worry, Elijah said to her, go on and prepare your meal, but first make a small loaf from what you have and bring it to me and then prepare the rest for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the bowl will not run out of flour, or the jar 
run out of oil before the day that I, the Lord, send rain. The widow went and did as Elijah told her, and all of them had enough food for many days. As the Lord had promised through Elijah, the bowl did not run out of flour, nor did the jar run out of oil. Let's join in praise once again as we sing hymn 502, Take My Life, Lord, Let It Be. Second reading is taken from First Kings, uh, chapter seventeen, verses seventeen to twenty-four. Some time later, the widow's son got sick. He got worse and worse, and finally he died. She said to Elijah, "Man of God, why did you do this to me? Did you come here to remind God of my sins and so cause my son's death? Give the boy to me," Elijah said. He took the boy from her arms, carried, her, carried him upstairs to the room where he was staying, and laid him on the bed. Then he prayed aloud, O oh Lord my God, why have you done such a terrible thing to this widow? She has been kind enough to take care of me, and now you kill her son. Then Elijah stretched himself out on the boy three times and prayed, O oh Lord my God, Restore this child to life. The Lord answered Elijah's prayer. The child started breathing again and revived. Elijah took the boy back downstairs to his mother and said to her, Look, your son is alive. She answered, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the Lord really speaks through you. Amen. Thanks be to God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to thee, O Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
What is the most talked about thing we, that, that we do? Uh, well, we don't speak about Brexit anymore. That's, that's past. Um, independence debate, well, that's in the background. Whitehall parties, no mention of them here. My bad taste in waistcoats, don't go there. No, what do we talk about most? It's the weather. We can't stop ourselves, can we? The weather's an opener when we want to start a conversation with somebody, no matter whether we, we know them well or we don't know them. It's a, a common point of conversation. We all have a, a view o- on the weather. It affects our pocket with increased energy prices on a, a cold and wintry day. You need to switch, switch the heating up. The weather affects the way we are, our mood. We're almost obsessed with it. Now, I don't say this as a a criticism. It's a a self-evident observation. And so at the the time of 1 Kings, people had come to worship a weather god. The god Baal. And here's some ancient inscriptions, there's an ancient statue, a monument. Baal was a a real thing. The sun and the rain were a matter of of life and death to people. It was a desert, it was a rural community. If it was too hot and the crops failed, then the people starved. If there was no rain, then there would be famine. The population blamed their leaders for inaction. We don't blame our leaders today, do we, for inaction? But we almost think the same, don't we? We look to our leaders to be moral arbiters, role models. And yet, from the beginning of time, leaders, as we heard in the story of King Ahab, were flawed. We know they don't control the weather, but King Ahab was married to Queen Jezebel. And that'll be a, a name that you'll know. It's one of, these, one of these folk names. There's been loads of books and films and plays all about Jezebel. A Jezebel, somebody is called. And Queen Jezebel, in, in the story of, of Elijah, spent years and years really rubbishing the belief in in God, in Yahweh. Why? To promote a belief in Baal, the God of weather and of nature. The parallels with with our age are kind of obvious. We in in the church, we get a, a bad press. We get ridiculed now for our religious beliefs. And worse, we try to get, people try and rub us out of history. Happy holiday, anyone. It's Christmas. There is an indifference towards religion and there's an embarrassment about God. Elijah was a prophet living in such an age. And yet it was worse then. There was a time of persecution. We're told in different parts of of 1 Kings that King Ahab was killing the servants or the local prophets of God. They went away and and hid in a cave. And so for Elijah to stand up, for Elijah to come out into public and say, look what's going wrong with our nation. He was challenging the whole culture. He was challenging the authorities who, let's face it, could put him to death. He was making big claims about God's power over the wind and the rain. I was doing a a crossword during the the course of of this week. And one of the clues in the crossword was, name a believer in a non-interventionist God. Name a believer in a non-interventionist God. Five letters. Anyone crossword fiends here? Anyone think what they know? Anyone know? Well, here's the answer. I didn't know. I had to look it up. A deist, a deist. 
And a deist is defined as someone who believes in the existence of God on the evidence of reason and of nature, but they reject spiritual or supernatural revelation. A God who created the world, but is then indifferent to it. Do we fall into the trap of thinking, as deists apparently do, that God doesn't really care? Every week we have two prayers, sometimes more in church, and week by week we pray that the world will be changed. The world will be more just. The world will be more loving, yet... I was talking last week about a God who calls the ordinary to be extraordinary. Each one of us, an ordinary Christian, is extraordinary in the eyes of God. Do we believe that we are part of an unfolding eternal story, or does life just go on unfolding? Are we prophetically called to do? And we had our, our new hymn in the reflection last week, and we, we sang it as our, as our young people's hymn, All that I am, all that I do, all that I ever have, I offer now to you. It's a complete picture, isn't it? And so we have the story of, of Elijah. We have a story of a, of a prophet, and we're, we're told in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 17, 3, that Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. Why? Because he was called to do. He did miracles. And so we have the story of a, a man who we hear was fed by birds. That's quite a, a remarkable story, because birds are very greedy creatures, any who have ever watched them. We're told of a marvelous story of food that never runs out. And we're heard that we told of the first story of resurrection. To believe in a God out there, as we heard in the Exodus story last week, an undefined God. A God that's not boxed by human definitions, the I am that I am. But a God who breathed life into the world, who breathed life into a dying child. So what of that story? Elijah was revered because of this very story that we shared this morning. He comes upon someone not to give, but to receive. God calls them in the story to go out and find a woman who was nearly destitute. A woman who was at the last a woman who could barely feed her, her own child. And it says in the story that once she had had that meal, they would starve to death. That's really quite a dramatic thing to say. So Elijah, so God says to Elijah, remember his prophet, go out and look for someone who can't give. But he asks the woman to give what little she has and to share it. It's quite something, isn't it? It's quite, it's quite something to ask someone who has very little, give back to God. Sometimes we don't believe that if we bless others, others will, will bless us. It's a very kind of selfish culture we live in. And so he demands of this woman who has very little. And she makes a meal, and we find the miraculous element of the meal is that it's a never-ending meal. Just as she gives her last, then God gives much to her. A meal that never, never ends. The ingredients never run out. The feast, the feast of God. Do we believe that God, if we give what little that we have, God will then bless us in return and it will never run out. That's the, the moral of the story. But then we hear in the story that the child either dies or is about to die. Depends which version of the story you, you, you actually read. But it's a terrible situation and any of us who've been in that situation with a child will know that it's your, it's your worst nightmare. And so she accuses Elijah. Remember, she's just fed Elijah. So she accuses God, come on, 
if your God's so wonderful, do something for me now. She demands of God. So what does Elijah do? He takes the child upstairs and he prays to God that the child is healed. And in some translations it says that he gives the boy the kiss of life. He breathes life into it. Now, we don't know the circumstances. We don't know the exact thing of the story, whether the child had died or the child was just near death. But whatever the, the, the circumstances of it, there is a miracle. The boy is saved by the power of prayer. And it's a happy ending. We all like a, a happy ending. And it's the first miracle of coming back to life. God, in the form of Elijah, breathes life into the boy. The world tells us, a reason tells us, none of that can happen. Birds can't feed someone. You can't have an everlasting meal. People coming back to life, well, that's, that's what the world tells us. That's what our brain tells us. We know that. The story is about relationship. The story is about the relationship that we have with God and that God has with humanity and the world. We are asked to give in this story. We are that mother that doesn't have a lot compared to God. And if we give to God, then Elijah says, God will give to us bountiful, a food that never runs out. There are many modern Miracles. Maybe you've experienced one yourself. Maybe you've, you've, you've read of one. And study after study shows that people benefit from prayer. When people are trying to heal, if they know that they are praying and that other people are praying for them, more people get better than if they don't have that. As we respond to our giving, God responds to our need. When we pray, God listens. God hears us. If not, then we're all deists. We all believe in a non-interventionist God, and quite frankly, what's the point? God understands us. God reflects back to us inside our minds through a, a hymn tune, through a prayer, through something that you'll, 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 you'll hear on the internet. The power of prayer gives us resilience. The power of prayer gives us transformation from the burdens that we have. The power of prayer can give us that sense of peace that we long for. The power of prayer is God coming through us. Some people still believe that God punishes us for our, for our sins. They did in the ancient world. But the story of Noah is all about God promising never, never, never again to use a great flood to punish humanity. People often miss that. They, they see it just as a children's story with the arky arky, and yeah, it's great fun. But the purpose of the story is for God to say, I won't punish the world. If not, then why doesn't God punish the world ten times over for all the wicked things that happen? And so, but Elijah wants us to believe that God's power is still an interventionist power. But if we believe in a God of love, can love be negative? Can love cause evil? That's a very, very big question, which I'm not going into in this sermon. But if we believe that God is a God of love, then God cannot do evil. God cannot kill people, because that would not be loving. God cannot be negative. Elijah wants us to believe that God is the saving power for the world. He saw starvation all around him. He saw that the rains weren't coming. All the badness in the world that Ahab couldn't cause the rain. Baal was a, a false god, and yet the world wanted to be fed and changed. There is the story of Elijah challenging the priests of Baal, and that's a, that's a different story. But what I want us to focus on today is Elijah, the prophet of doing. Not the prophet of doom, as I very nearly wrote down one time when I was looking over the sermon. 
Elijah is teaching us that by doing, by doing the power of prayer, God heals us and something happens. So I want to invite us now in our reflection this morning just to invite us to, to have our, our own prayers. And I'll start us off, I'll, I'll say a line, and then I'll leave a moment of quiet and of silence. And then when I say, Lord, hear our prayer, offer those prayers to God. Let's join our hearts and minds now in prayer today. Let us pray. Lord, as Elijah was fed in a strange and unusual way, the story teaches us that you'll not abandon us. Let us pray for, for all who feel abandoned. Feed us, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, as Elijah met the needs of the woman and her son by always providing food and drink to sustain. Let us pray today for, for all our needs to be sustained. Feed us, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, Elijah healed and breathed a life-giving spirit, giving resurrection. Let us pray for that life-giving spirit. Heal us, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And in our prayers today, Lord, we give thanks for that prophet that prophet of doing. For the Gospels tell us the greatest prophet, the greatest prophet who fed, who sustained, and who healed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And I would like to invite Mary to share with us our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's once again join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son, for his life, sufferings, and death, and for his resurrection and ascension, for the witness, salvation, and hope he gives. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to those who follow you, and especially for the gift of that Spirit in your Church. We rejoice in the work and witness of your Church, and pray that it may continue to strive to fulfil your work and proclaim your love. We pray for the needs of the world, thinking especially of all those suffering in any way for those for whom hunger and drought are their only daily ration, for those living with the threat or reality of civil war, for those whose lives and family life are ravaged by the effects of drugs or alcohol, for the homeless and the unemployed and all on the margins of society. We pray especially that your healing hand will reach out to all in pain or discomfort, to all those awaiting results of tests or recovering from surgery. Especially be with the family of our dear friend Nan Bramley as they prepare for their final farewell. May your everlasting arms surround and support them and all who mourn. We give thanks for those who seek to help and comfort those in need. Be with those whose lives impact others, health care and emergency workers, teachers and all those on whom people depend. Grant them the wisdom and the strength to know 
and to follow your way. Leaders in government, may they always seek the correct and moral way to govern rather than methods of expediency and the quick fix. May your blessing rest on our sovereign as she celebrates her platinum jubilee year. May she continue to serve with dignity, compassion and grace. We pray that in our own lives we may better come to know your love in Jesus and may be strengthened by your spirit to follow you. Amen. Thank you, Mary. And now our offering shall be received. Good morning, friends, and welcome to our service, whether you're here in person, watching, or listening on the telephone later today. Uh, I do hope that we all experience a blessing from this year fellowship, even at a distance. Please take time following the service to share in socially distant fellowship over tea and coffee in the hall at the end of the service. Our thanks today go to Keith for leading our worship and to Neil for his reading and Mary for leading our prayers <clears throat> and to the production team of May, Neil and Billy for the preparation, editing and production of the finished product. We'll be blessed with two speakers at the men's club on, uh, tomorrow evening when Colin Smith and Carol and Christie from Carers Together uh, come along to tell us something of that organisation's work. Everyone is welcome to share in the meeting which starts at 7.30 in the conference room. And just a reminder that uh, while the, there are a number of relaxations, we're now nearly back to what, what, what could be termed normal. The, the, the advice from the Scottish Government is that there's still a long way to go and that before we meet with anyone out with our household, we should undertake a lateral flow test. There are test kits still available at the rear of the church if you require one, please take them and please, please use them. As is noted on the order of service, but for the benefit of those viewing online or on the telephone, Nan Bramley's funeral will take place tomorrow at Holytown Crematorium at 9.30am. A live stream of the service will be available and details are printed in the order of service and will be shown on a slide at the close of our online service. So if you're viewing, please have pen and paper handy to note the details. Our congratulations, our belated congratulations this morning, go to Helen Irving, who celebrated her birthday last week. Congratulations and many of them, Helen. I'm also pleased to report that Tom Ferrier is recovering at home following a spell in hospital. We send our best wishes as always in prayers to Tom and to all who are ill at home or in hospital. And the usual hygiene reminder, please leave the sanctuary at the end of the service, starting at the rear or as directed by the door duty elders. Any face coverings should be placed in the bins provided. 
please use the hand sanitizer, maintain that reasonable distance apart when chatting outside after the service. And as always, to everyone, stay calm, stay safe, stay praying, and God bless you all.